Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Yes, let's just sit up and be prepared to be blessed by the word of God, because God that we serve is a mighty God and He's a great God. Hallelujah. Tell someone next to you, God has a message for you. I want, if you are alone, I want to speak it up into the atmosphere. God has a message for you. God has a message for me. Because our God is a good God and He is a living God that seeks to speak to us. You know, I love especially the last quarter of the year, you know, in October, November, and December. The reason is because Christmas is near and I just always feel that, especially in October, November, and December, there is a sense of a new hope that God has placed into our heart. Even though it might have not been a year that we wanted to, but we know very well that because of Jesus coming to earth through the sun, you know, through, through the virgin birth, you know, we can have new hope on God. God wants to bless you with a new hope. Can you smile to somebody, touch someone and say, God has hope for, for your dreams. God has hope for your dreams. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, it's great to have dreams. When we talk about dreams over here, we are not talking about the, the nocturnal visions that we have at night when we are sleeping and we have a dream. That might be one of them, but we are talking about visions, ambitions, desires, you know, that God wants, God has shown to us of who we can be and what we can do in our life. Now, I think let's be honest, you know, most of us, you know, if we are, we, if God wills, we may live to 100 years old, but whether it's 80, 90, or 100, or 110, what is most important is that, right, we are able to embrace God's dreams and we become that person that God wants us to be, not only for our family, but for, uh, for the people around us, and maybe even for society and for the world. You know, I want you to know that God has dreams for you and for me. You know, when I was 18 years old, when I became, when I had, I was born again as a Christian, you know, to a, to a church youth camp, you know, I got placed within me a dream, some dreams rather, you know, and one of the dreams that God has placed in, in my life, which I, which many may not, many people would not believe that at that point, was that I want to begin to be a praise and worship leader. I want to be able to lead people in church. I want to lead people, you know, with the ability with to into the presence of God with praise and worship. And I knew very well that is a dream that is from God because, you know, I am definitely I do not have a nice voice, you know. In fact, you know, I I do not I'm I'm, I'm kind of tone deaf, you know, in those years. And to for me to be able to lead praise and worship. The dream is definitely not according to what I had at the moment. But we must understand that God's dreams are always larger than who we are. Because in the course of us pursuing God's dreams, we become the person that God wants us to be because we look upon Jesus as the source of all our provision. Now, of course, you know, I begin to imitate and look and observe how anointed praise and worship leaders are leading, you know, the people and choosing their songs, you know, and I, the, and, and as I go along, I dream of becoming a musician. And that is definitely another dream that is larger than who I was and what I could do. Because brought up in an underprivileged family, I wasn't able to have any instrument, nor could I have received any music lessons. But God's dreams are always bigger than who we are and what we have. In fact, one of the measure of God's dream versus a personal dream is when that dream is larger than us. You know, that is what God wants us to stretch our faith. But now what I'll say to you is this, while I may have been receiving those, what I had received those dreams when I was younger, I thought that those were the dreams. But I never realized that God has got larger dreams because there are dreams that are part of God's larger dreams. And the larger dreams that God has for me, has for me was to be able to become a preacher, a pastor, 
a teacher and a church planter where people will come to know Jesus through the ministries that I can give. Now, all the, all the, not that all the dreams of being able to be a praise and worship leader, to be a, to be a musician are not important. But I want to know that everything that God has placed into our life, it is part of a larger plan. Your dream of having a beautiful family, they can be, they are from God, but they, it is a part of a larger plan. Your dream to have a blessed, financially blessed career and job, you know, they, are, they can be from God. But it is important for us to know that it is part of a larger plan of God. God has placed within you in that place for a purpose, not just to receive a fat paycheck or to have a good job title. It is larger than that. You know, when you, when you pray for God to bless your health and the health of your family and your loved one, well, that is God's dreams. But those dreams are part of God's larger dream. When you begin to receive healing, when you begin to receive health and be blessed by all these good things, you should become an ambassador, a mouthpiece whereby you brag and you boast about how good our God is. And through that, Jesus is glorified. I want you to understand this. Every good thing that we receive in our life, those are part of God's larger plan that we may be able to go around to preach and to teach and to reach out to people whose dreams, whose dreams are like us but have not been fulfilled. And today I want to share with you again about dreams. In Genesis chapter 37, the Bible talks about the fact that there was this 17-year-old teenager whose name was Joseph. Can you say Joseph? J-O-S-E-P-H. Joseph. Joseph had a dream. And the dream, although it was eventually fulfilled, I want to bring to you a lesson that will bless your heart today. All of us want to have dreams for our families, for our jobs, for our finances, for the work of God, for our health. And I want you to know that Joseph's dreams was ultimately fulfilled. But one thing that people do not realize, or we may have forgotten, that Joseph's dreams died many times. If you are taking down notes, put it down. Joseph's dreams died many times. You see, Joseph's dreams died many times. His dream was killed many times. Let me use even a more brutal word. Joseph's dreams was murdered many times. And even in and the first murder of Joseph's dream was actually undertaken by his family. Joseph's dreams was killed by his family. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 37, verse 19 to 20. Genesis chapter 37, verse 19 to 20. As I said, for those of you that are taking down notes, scribble down on a piece of paper, Genesis chapter 37, verse 19 to 20. So that in the course of this week, you know, if you are a pastor, use this passage to preach to others. If you are a teacher, teach somebody about these particular two verses. You know, if you are using it for yourself, meditate on it. So that the Holy Spirit will begin to stir you further and let you know the secrets of God's heart. Genesis chapter 37, verse 19 and 20 says this, They said to one another, Who are they? The brothers of Joseph. Look, this dreamer is coming. Now, I want you to notice this. I want you to notice that, you know, the word of God is very beautiful. If you are willing to set apart time each day to study the word of God, you will realize that God is real. There is no way to know that God is real unless you spend time in God's word. And in this passage, it says, look, 
this dreamer is coming. Who is the dreamer? Joseph. Now, we to realize this, the brothers, the family, did not see Joseph as just a brother. He saw Joseph as a dreamer. In other words, right, what identifies Joseph was not just about his kinship, but was his dreams that he had. And in verse 20, the brothers came together and said to one another, Come, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits, into one of those underground cisterns. And we will say to our father, A wild beast has killed and devoured him. Now watch the last statement. We shall see what will become of his dreams. It's interesting, isn't it? Joseph's brothers, his family, did not just see that he they killed, they will be killing Joseph, but they saw that they saw themselves not only killing Joseph, but they saw themselves killing Joseph's dreams. Wow, what a revelation. Many of us never realize that when the evil ones, Satan, the enemy, make life difficult for you so that you will give up, we always think that the enemy was only scheming against us. But I want you to understand this. The enemy is not just inter interested in killing you. He is interested in killing your dreams. The dreams that you have for Jesus, the dreams that you had when you see yourself leading hundreds, thousands of people through your praise and worship. Joseph's dreams was not, was, Joseph was not just intended to be killed by his brothers. The brothers were wanting to kill his dreams. Whatever difficulties, trials that you might be facing, I want you to realize this. It is not just a murder attempt of, your, of you, but of your life, but a murder and assassination directed at your dream. You may want to be a missionary. You want to preach out to the, imi the, the immigrants, the immigrant workers, and, you, and yet, at the same time, you realize that somehow your job itself is so difficult that you can't even focus on getting your job done well. Your career seems to be stuck. Now, I want to realize this. The enemy is not trying to kill your job. The enemy is trying to assassinate and murder the dream that you have for God to reach out to the nations. Joseph's dreams died many times. But we serve a great God. Joseph's dreams was, were killed many times and in the first attempt to assassinate his dreams were from his family. You see, Joseph was not killed. His dreams was what the enemies were aiming for. We learn from the Bible that Joseph was thrown into a pit. Some of you may be struggling. You know, you want your family to do well. No, it's not about, if you rest this, it's not just about your family doing well. You hope to see your children achieving these ambitions one day. You hope to see your children become a teacher in the children ministry, in the youth ministry. You see yourself, your children becoming a missionary. You see yourself, you see your children becoming God-fearing, God-loving people. And therefore, you want to provide for them well. But we have forgotten that the, providing for them well is not the dream. That dream is part of God's bigger dreams. But if you're not careful, we will let we will think that the enemy wanted to destroy. Or sometimes we think that, right, by doing something for God, the dream will be murdered. No, it's a smaller dream. God is in the business of causing all our dreams in our life and for our loved one to be fulfilled. Can you say amen and hallelujah to that? 
Joseph was thrown into a pit, ultimately was sold into his way to Egypt. That looks like the end of Joseph's dream. But I want to understand this. Joseph's dreams died once. You know, he was sold to a place to Egypt. Many people never think that, never realize this. Maybe you say that, oh, lucky Joseph, he did not die. Can I say to so you, right? For his brothers to sell, it is actually more ruthless for his brothers to sell him to Egypt. Because that will mean that for the rest of Joseph's life, he will be living in slavery. And the Egyptians, in the way that in those times, would never ever treated a Hebrew boy with kindness. A death, a physical immediate death, would have been more merciful. And Joseph's brothers were more than aware of that. But yet they sold, and ultimately he was, they were sold. He was sold to Egypt to become a slave. And in Genesis chapter 39, verses 1 to 4, I want to write this. It says in verse 1 of chapter 39, and I'd like you to look at the word that the Bible has been using. Now, Joseph had been taken. You, know, you see, you notice know carefully, look at the verse in front of you. It could have been said this, Joseph had been taken to Egypt. But it did not say that. What was the additional word in this particular verse? It did not say Joseph had been taken to Egypt. What was an additional word that was added in there? It says Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. What a word to describe Joseph's life at the point. This 17-year-old teenager who has God's dreams, he was taken down. Church, I want to understand this. The enemy is always actively taking your dreams down. By all the discouragement, by all the temptation, by all the fear and all the intimidation, when you begin to see that something may not be as desirable with your children, you know, it was the attempt and the assassination that the enemy is taking, is, is taking for you to be taken down and your dream to be taken down. When you see that all of a sudden a particular report, medical report comes to your life and threaten and seems to show some indication that your, your, your later days of your, year, of your years will be threatened with sickness and disease. It was a scheme of the devil, not just to take you, but to take you down and to take down your dreams. But let, and praise be to God, that we know that our God is a God of resurrection. That when our dreams seems to be dying, you know, God is in the business of resurrecting. Now, even though Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer or the captain of the royal bodyguard, it is like he was like the, the one in charge of, uh, of the secret intelligence of Pharaoh have, have bought him from the Ishmaelite who had taken him down there. Again, see, notice the word who had taken him down there. The world is always very keen to take us and our dreams down. And in, but yet in verse 2, beautiful verse. In verse 2, it says, The Lord was with Joseph. Can you tell someone next to you, The Lord is with you. Tell somebody and say, The Lord is with you. And because the Lord is with you, raise up your hand and say, the Lord is with me. Raise up your left hand and say, the Lord is with me. Yes, when you raise up your hand and say that, the Lord is with me, I want to say, I want, you may think that it's childish, you may think that it's naive, but I tell you this, if you have faith as small as a master seed, and we are willing to raise up your hand, your right hand and your left hand, and say, the Lord is with me, you know what the Lord will do with you? The Lord will make you a successful and prosperous man. Can you say amen to that? Raise your hand and say, the Lord is with me. And the Lord will make you a successful and prosperous man and woman. Though you are in the house of your master. Wow. 
Don't you love that? All of us are working for somebody. Or, or rather, most of us, rather, you know, our, our employer, our bosses, you know, look like that master. Those of us who are running a business, we always think that the customer is like a master because they are the one that decide whether my business will flourish. Some of us who are working, we are so intimidated by our boss, our supervisors, because we are afraid that we will lose our job. But can I say this to you? Though you think that whatever dreams that God has for you, if you are willing to let the Lord be with you, you are going to be successful and prosperous. Say amen to that. You know, even if you think that your children are not growing up the way you wanted to at this moment, because of where you are and where they are right now, I want to know that as long as the Lord is with you, you shall be successful and prosperous. Amen? You know, although Joseph was not with his family, sometimes some of you, because of your, of your desire to, to support your family, you know, you are away for your family and you are with a master. Can I say this to you? As long as the Lord is with you, you shall be successful and prosperous. Smile to someone next to you and say that that is really good. That is really good. Smile to God. Know that the Lord is with you. When you allow Him to do that, He will make you. He will make you successful and prosperous. And in verse 3, it says that even the master, even your boss, even your supervisor, even your customer, even your business owner can see, can saw that the Lord was with Joseph and how the Lord has caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. And in verse 4, it says, So Joseph found favor in God's, in his sight, and became the one in charge of the household. Now, I want you to realize this. Sometimes when things go difficult, and you may be in a place that you is not ideal for you, it's not as good as you wanted to, because you are under intimidation, you live under, under lack, because you live under certain amount of insecurity, because you have no idea what is life like tomorrow. I want to understand this. The Lord is with you, and the Lord will make you prosperous and successful. Isn't this good news? Isn't this good news? You know, Potiphar, the captain of the secret intelligence of Pharaoh, began to trust that man, began to trust Joseph, and gave Joseph everything to be responsible for. Now then, of course, we all know that Joseph's dreams were murdered, firstly by his brothers, and now he is into a, into a land whereby he was a slave. But of course, God found favor. He has favor with God. But, you know, maybe you think, oh, Joseph may be thinking, oh, it's possible that my dream is going to, maybe, he doesn't record, maybe Joseph forgot about his dreams because of the difficulties in life. Some of you may have forgotten. Why do you leave your homeland from India, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from Philippines, and come to Singapore to work. Some of you may have forgotten, why do you leave Singapore to go to another place to work? Why were you uprooted? And you thought that your dreams are all dead. God is not finished with you. God is not finished with you. I know that some of us, we have been praying for your children that they will come to know Jesus or they will come back to Jesus again and serve God and His work. And your prayer seems to be unanswered for a long while. Can I say this to you? It looks like the dream was, is dead. But I've got good news for you. We serve a God of resurrection. And Joseph... His God was with him. 
and ultimately he was prosperous. Now, of course, you know, we did not have any record whether Joseph had forgotten his dream or Joseph was excited. And maybe a dream, the dream that he used to have was ignited and sparked. But the good, but the thing is this: after all the good things happening to him, in the same chapter of Genesis 39, verse 7, he says this: after all this event, in verse 7, that the master's wife, Potiphar's wife, looked with desire at Joseph. And she said to Joseph, Come and sleep with me. Come and lie with me. And in verse 8, it says, But Joseph refused. I like this. But Joseph refused. He said, No. Can you look at somebody say, Say no to the world? Joseph refused. Can you say someone one more time? Tell someone on your left, on your right, that I shall say no to the world. Joseph said no. He refused the temptation. Now it looks very good. It looks so easy. Can I just say this to you, right? When Joseph said no to the world and the standards and what the world would be doing, Joseph has caused the second death of his dream. You see, he will be thinking, oh, I'm nearer to, my, to, the, to the dream of me being rising up and above my brothers and my sis, my brothers, you know, and even my parents. When things were good happening, you know, but then when the world tempted him and he said no and he refused, this refuser, saying no to the world, saying no to the way the world looks at things, Joseph dream was murdered the second time now please do not ever underestimate the temptation that joseph had we might think that oh it's so easy to say no how can i ever think of it you know it's a fair please do not imagine this i really think this because the world is really powerful you must understand this Scripture in verse 6 of Genesis 39 recorded that, records that Joseph was handsome. Wow. It says that Joseph was a, in verse 6, that Joseph was a handsome man. He was attractive. Now watch carefully. Look at the verse in front of you. The last part. He was not only handsome and attractive, he was handsome and attractive in both the form and appearance. Not just a, a nice face. Even his well-built in form, probably nice muscles, six, you know, with six abs, nice biceps, triceps, or whatever you can call that. He was a very, very attractive man, a very handsome and a well-built, and he was young. Now you must understand this: Joseph was tempted because he was tempting. Joseph was tempted because he was tempting. Now, I want to understand this. I, I can understand how we can be tempted because the things that are tempting us are tempting. When the world shows to us, if you follow these ways, you will be prosperous. When you just put all your time, 24 plus set plus one a day for your boss, you will be recognized and be rewarded. It's tempting. When you say that I want to do this for my children, you know, because that's what the rest of the world is doing. I want to understand this. I am not belittling the attraction that you are facing. Joseph was tempted because he was tempting. The world tells you that you do this. The reality is this. What the world tells you is attractive. You know, all the, all the parents in the school, nine out of 10 parents are doing, raising our children in this manner. Why are you the only one? 
Look at our nine children. They are so good in their study. They are so good socially, emotionally, psychologically, mentally, physically. But why are you not doing that? Joseph was tempted because he was tempting. You are tempted because the world is tempting. But Joseph understands this. He's, or rather he experienced this. The minute he refused and said no to the ways of the world and the works of the world, Joseph's dreams died the second time. Because it says, you know, now you might understand this, not only that the Joseph was tempted because he was tempting, the next verse in verse 10 says this, as she spoke to Joseph, now Potiphar's wife was really persistent. It says that Potiphar's wife spoke to Joseph persistently day after day, and she kept, pre kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day. Now I can understand and I'm not and I do not want you to belittle the pressure that you are facing. Some of you want to be a, a, a godly man for God, a godly woman for God. Some of you want to be blessed, but blessed in God's ways. And that is pressurizing. The scripture says that, right? You know, that's why I said, do not ever underestimate the, the pressure that Joseph was going through. It was attractive to him as well. And here, the pressure that the wife was putting unto him, it says he was, she was putting pressure on him day after day. I am not belittling the temptation that you are facing. You may say that, I, I, Pastor, I have no time to serve God because I want to be blessed in my career. And you know, be blessed in my career, I need to give all my time. I can't afford to lead my praise and worship, teach the Bible, or to have a small group in my house. I can't afford to just even arrange for coffee to reach out to this particular sister who needs help. That's what the world is always pressurizing you. That's why you have people saying to, you hear Christians saying this, I have, no, I have no time for all these things. You know, it's so interesting. We may have no time for serving God, but the minute our boss sends us a text, an email, we can give them, we can run to them, run to her, you know, letting go of our children, our household chores, our partners, our spouses, our parents, our God's work, and we serve them without saying that, hey, you must understand, I have no time because family is first, but at the time, the career is first. Now, I understand this. This is how the world will pressurize us. And jo it was not a matter of one temptation that Joseph was facing. The temptation was ongoing day after day. And of course, you know the answer. One day in Genesis chapter 39, verse 9 onwards, you know, to verse 11, no, rather, you know, jo but Joseph was not, was refusing and say no to all the pressures. Now, you must understand this. God knows that the world is tempting you because and it is tempting. God knows that the pressure that you are facing to let go of your dreams is really real. Because that's what the world is showing us. You could have easily rationalized. Joseph, it's not difficult to, to imagine Joseph situation or circumstance, the pressure and demand that you are facing, a place, understand this, a place where no one can see your decisions. What has happened in the last two years when the church, because of COVID-19 and, and all the restriction, do not have to meet and are not connected when there is always curfew, we cannot gather together in the cafe, in the coffee shops, go to someone's house. You know what has that, what has that caused many Christians? It has caused many Christians to make wrong decisions easier because they are away from God's house. They are away from the physical proximity of the brothers and sisters in Christ. 
where they when they make a decision they can run away from the accountability all i need to do is to drop a text i'm not i'm not coming here to church anymore i cannot serve i cannot serve in this area anymore i am busy and there's no need for any accountability anymore you must understand this it was it could have been easy for joseph to excuse all the pressure and demands it could have been easy for joseph to make a wrong decision because anyway he was not with people who know him not far from his family and the third one is this joseph was in a higher position he can make mistakes and no one will dare to point a finger at him isn't it like this Joseph could have easily rationalized his way out. In fact, he could be the smart guy who says this. I think God is forgiving. He will understand one day. But that is what the world is doing. Isn't this what the world is doing to us? Sadly, isn't this what many blessed Christians are doing in God's house? The human mind is able to rationalize anything that the human heart wants to do. Let me just repeat that. The human mind has the ability to rationalize everything and anything that the human heart has set to do. And it can be bypassed as being rational. I want to understand this. Rational has never been part of the Bible. <laughs> the Bible says you walk by faith and not by sight. But one thing Joseph did not rationalize in this way because he had one thing in his mind. And in Genesis chapter 39, verse 9, Joseph said this, How could I do this great and evil wickedness? and sin against God. In fact, it says, and sin against your husband. Joseph had this particular reason to say no. How can I, and notice the word that he used, how can I ever be so evil? How can I be so ever wicked and sin against God? Of course, we know the rest of the story. Ultimately, Potiphar's wife one day tried to grab Joseph in verse 11 to 18 by his you know and to and ask joseph to lie with her but joseph but she grabbed joseph it's very interesting go to verse 12 in genesis chapter 39 in genesis chapter 39 verse 12 it says this it says that right she caught joseph by his outer root now i want to notice this what did potiphar's wife caught him he did, she did not catch him, but she caught him by his outer coat. Now we all understand this. What was the coat or the outer garment? Significance with Joseph. It represents his dreams. That's why we all, we all know, for those of who know the Bible as well, Joseph multicolored outer coat. And the scripture says so, so beautifully, the adult, the attempted adulterous attempted to catch him, but never caught him, but caught him by his coat. I like to say this, the world is always not only interested in catching you, but the world is interested in catching your dreams and make them taken away from you. Isn't that revelational? And, and ultimately, as the story revealed, you notice this. What was the basis that Joseph's dream was murdered? The basis of Joseph's dream being murdered the second time was said clearly from verse 13 all the way to verse 18. Let's do a, a quick one. In verse 13, when she saw that he left his rope in her hand. Notice carefully, the dream that was stolen away at that point was the basis of that accusation the garment 
the multi, uh, you know, in this case, the coat, the dream that Joseph had was used, was murdered. That was a piece of evidence. And again, you know, go to verse 15. When he heard me screaming, he left his robe behind. Again, the coat. And then in verse, and then in verse 18, it says, As soon as I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment, he left his robe and his, and his outer coat with me and ran outside with me. Now, can I say this to you? Joseph dreams was murdered the second time and the second time Joseph was brought to prison. Can I say this to you, right? When you are thinking about God's dreams, never underestimate how much spiritual warfare is going on in your life just to kill your dream. When you come to Singapore, when you leave your homeland to another place, when you go, not only you coming to Singapore, or maybe you are you are going to somewhere else to work, you wanted to be a lighthouse. You wanted to be the Christian that reached out to your fellow immigrant colleagues. And life gets hard. You begin to say that, oh, I have no more time for that. Can I say this to you, right? The world wants to kill your dreams. You see yourself 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, leading praise and worship in front of hundreds and thousands. But when all the lights are gone, when all the instruments are no more there, when the crowd don't seem to have come, you begin to forget and say that, I think it's time to call it quit. You see, the thing is this, God is the God wants to cause you not to be the worship leader, but God first wants to test whether are you the worshiper. The world wants to take away your dreams. The world is interested to take away your dream. You may be saying, why is success so slow? If it's, if it's from God, why is this, this dream so, so, so hard? Let me ask you a question. Some people will say this, you know, brothers, sisters, if this church is from God, why is it so slow and so difficult? If it's from God, it must be easy. It must be successful quick. Can I say to you, right? Can you tell me which part of the Bible says that? Can you say to somebody, it's true? The Bible never says that. The Bible never says. The Bible says God may have given you a promise that wherever you are right now, whether it's in your homeland or away from your homeland, I will be with you. The Bible never says we, you, once you reach that place, you will straight away be earning lots of money. Work is not, it's going to be so easy. You can shake leg and still take a good salary. The Bible never says when you're going to reach out to this particular uh, uh, ethnic group, this particular country, you know, oh, the door will be flung open immediately. Oh, no, the Bible never says that. Why on earth do Christians judge our dreams based on whether is it slow or fast? This is nonsense. Tell somebody to you, this is nonsense. In fact, it's never from the Bible. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to encourage you. If you think that you are pursuing God's dreams and they are difficult and slow, it does not mean that it is not from God. Amen? It's not from God. It's not that what, it's not what God says. At least that's not what the Bible says. Joseph did what was right in God's eyes and he got into prison for two years with a false accusation. His dream died the second time. In fact, the Bible, I say this because the Bible says this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For what credit is there? Is it, amen. That's right. I love the amen. For what credit is it when you, are, when you have done something wrong, you are harshly treated and punished for it. You have to endure. Watch the second part. But when you do good 
and do what is right and you suffer for it, if you are to patiently endure it, if you are to patiently bear all this undeserved suffering, do you know what this, your, the scripture verse by New King James Version says, this is commendable before you. Let me read another translation for you that you may even find even much more encouraging. This will find favor with God. Hallelujah. When you are suffering for God's dreams and you are waiting patiently, and the Bible says these are undeserved suffering, but you will find favor with God. Amen. You find favor with God when you endure. What was God doing? What is the big deal over here? God was trying to find out what was Joseph made of. I want to I scribble down a few words over here and I want to be careful by reading it carefully because I think these few words are crafted very carefully. And I want to listen, it, listen to it attentively. You are doing well in the palace, but can you handle the prison? You are enjoying the blessings, but can you entrust God with the blessings? In other words, right? You are enjoying what is good, but can you entrust God what is good? You are enjoying the blessings of all the good things in your life, your career, your job, your health, your wealth, but can you entrust God these good things? You have been giving, watch the next statement that's equally as powerful. You have been giving what you have as your offerings. But can you give what you have as sacrifices? You have been giving what you have a portion of it as an offering. But can you give what you have as sacrifices? Because it's easier to give. It's easier. I'm not saying that it's easy. But it's a little bit easier to give what we have according, oh, one-tenth of it. But can you give what you have as sacrifices? Where it pains you. When it makes you feel a little more insecure. Oh, if I give up this time for God's work, it makes me feel insecure because I never, I, I will have no time for, for my career, for my children. You have trusted me because of what you see. But can you trust me with what you cannot see? You have trusted me with what you see. In fact, because of what you see, you become more confident. But can you trust me with what you cannot see? With the dreams and visions that I have? Hang on to your dream, but my brothers and sisters. Can you hold on to your dreams? Don't ever sacrifice a great dream or God's dream on the altar because of a lesser dream. You know, I read a particular quote. Someone said, Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, says this, discernment is not about knowing the difference between good and bad. Discernment is about knowing the difference between the best and the good. Discernment is about understanding the difference between God's and the good. The, the reality is this. Many of us whom we know of are so quick to make immediate decisions, putting and sacrificing a larger dream on the altar of a lesser God. 
Genesis chapter 39, verse 21 says this. But the Lord, sure, Joseph's dreams was murdered once by his family. Second time, Joseph's dreams was murdered by the world. And he was imprisoned. But in Genesis chapter 39, verse 21 says, But the Lord was with Joseph. And when the Lord was with Joseph, what happens to him? He experienced mercy, loving kindness, faithful love, and God gave him favor. Can you tell someone next to you, God gives me favor. God gives me favor. God gives you, now, God gave you favor when you are doing well in the palace. I want to tell you this. God gives you favor even when you are in prison. When you feel your life is limited, God gives you favor. Can you say amen to that? God gave you favor when you are enjoying your blessings. But I say this to you. God gives you favor when you entrust him your blessings. Surely, God has given you favor when you bring to him your offerings. But I want to say to you, God gives you favor when you give him your sacrifices. Can you say amen to that? When you are willing to sacrifice and put him on the altar, God shall give you and God gives you favor. God gave you favor and won your trust and your confidence with what you see. But I can say this to you, God gives you favor when you entrust him with what you cannot see. Amen? When you begin to take a step of faith, God give you favor. Hang on to God's dreams. Hold on into God's dreams. For God's dreams are not dead in your life. Sure, Joseph's dreams were killed by his family. Joseph's dreams tried... Joseph's brothers tried to murder his dreams. Joseph's dreams were killed by the world, by the worst ways and intimidation. If you don't do this, your children will be like that. If you don't do this, your job will be like that. And in fact, when Joseph said no to all these things, he lost his reputation. The gossips and the rumors, you can imagine that happens in the palace when he was thrown into prison. Does that sound familiar? It sounds really familiar to me. Gossips all around talking about attacking our personal character, questioning our, our track record of what we have sacrificed and commitment and our love for Jesus. Cast, you know, Malice, you know, about our, 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 our sense of godliness, our ability to hear God. Does that sound familiar? So you must understand this. Joseph's dreams were murdered the second time by the world. Why are you so foolish you do that? But I want to say this to all of you. And I will end with this particular scripture verse. John chapter 11, verse 25 to 26, this, say this. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Can someone shout out from where you are? Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And Jesus said to the woman, and now he says to, to the men as well, you who believes in me, in other words, whoever chooses to believe in me, though you may die, you shall live. He says that whoever believes in me, whoever trusts me, whoever relies in me. Last week or two weeks ago, I talked about 
not just having knowledge, but to acknowledge him. Whoever trusts in me, we depend on me. No, not depend on the calculation of the world. Not depend on the, on the worldly standard of the world. But whoever believes in me, they shall never die. Do you believe this? And in verse 26, it says, And whoever believes, who lives and believes in me shall never die. It's quite interesting when you look at these two verses. It looks, if you were careless about reading it, it looks like as if there is one, one, one resurrection. But I like to say this, I tend to see that there is a possible two resurrection over here, you know? Because at the verse 25, it says that, whoever believes in me, you will not die, you shall live. In other words, right, when you live, when you choose to put on the altar the larger dreams, that dream will resurrect. And, who, and that resurrected dream and you will never die. In other words, upon that resurrection, it shall never die. Do you believe this? My brothers and sisters in Christ, God isn't done with us yet. God still wants the work of God to continue. God wants you to speak. I, I can see some of the videos over here, so I'll be specific. God wants you to reach out to your Indian brothers and sisters in, around you, Indian brothers, Indian sisters around you, so that they know Jesus. God wants you, if you are a pastor, God wants you to know that your work is not dead yet. God wants to use you and to be able to impact the nations. If you have stopped worshipping and leading praise and worship or leading Bible study, God wants to tell you, your dream is not dead yet because he is the resurrection and the life. It is time for us to understand this. Some of us may have been killed. Our dreams may be killed by someone who knows us well, close to us. Some of us may be killed by the worldly intimidation. You know, people always tell me this. Very often, I hear people say that to me. Oh, you know, now that I have a family, you must understand this. It is really troublesome for me to bring my children to church. You know, it's really troublesome if, when I'm leading, when I'm preparing my sermon, when I'm preparing my praise and worship, when I'm recording my message, when I'm recording my praise and worship. You know, it takes a lot of effort to take care of my children, my husband or my wife or my parents. But it's interesting, you know. I want to say this in a very loving manner to all of you. We never find it troublesome when we are doing something we want. When our boss calls us, we never tell our boss. You know, boss is really troublesome, you know. It's really troublesome for me to make sure that my children be taken care of, running around while I'm doing the Zoom with you, you know. We never have that trouble when, when we are organizing for vacations and holidays. We are willing to pack 10, 10 suitcases, stuff all the, all the baby napkins, stuff with all the children's toys, with all the iPad, you know, with all the different medicine. And we never say, oh, it's really troublesome. <laughs> but when God says, my child, I want to do this. Oh God, you know something? You must understand this. It's really troublesome. When we say that, we are rationalizing with God's standard. I want to understand this. The world is shouting at us. And the world is not wanting to kill us. You know? The world wants to kill our dreams. You are struggling, pastor. The world is not wanting to kill you as a pastor. The world wants to kill your dream as a pastor. You are a struggling, struggling worker whom you think you have no time to be that light and the salt. 
to make disciples, to go to Bible studies, to sit down with someone to share about Jesus Christ. You may think that the world is trying to kill your time. The world is not killing your time. The world is killing your dream. You may be thinking that, oh, I'm afraid that my job, you know, will not be promoted when I set apart this time. And you may think that, oh, that is rationalizing. That is a ration. That is a logical rationale. Can I say to you, the world is going to bless your job. Sometimes for us, you know, the world, the world will bless you with the worldly things, but will kill your dreams for God. I want to stand here today and tell you this. Let us give God our dreams. I want to really un- you to know this. I love every one of you. You know what keeps me Hold on. I think I was told that the last few seconds has been lost. You see, the world is even wanting to kill this voice right now. I'm not joking with you. You all may think that it's it's a coincidence. Even the world and the spiritual forces is attempting to kill this last few seconds or last one minute of what I say. The world is in the business. The world will will bless you with physical things, with wealth, with career. It it means that it will kill your dreams that you have for God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is time for us to understand that God's dreams might look like they are killed. But God is a God of resurrection. Let us re- let us renew our calling. Let us begin to rediscover why are we who we are today. Let us begin to be reminded why are we having what we have today. They are all part of God's dreams. They are all part of God's dreams. And I pray that none of you are going to stand down. But you are going to hold on to your dreams. You are going to hang on to your dreams. Let me just pray for every one of you. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the life of Joseph that we are learning today. Lord, I thank you for reminding us that the Lord is with us. And the Lord is not only with us. When the Lord is with us, the Lord is with all our dreams. Though some of our dreams look like they are dead, though some of our dreams look like they are buried, buried with hurts, with disappointment, with despair, Sometimes we even think that our dreams are buried with injustice. God, we thank you that today we are reminded that God is with us. Therefore, we surrender our life to you right now. I want every one of you to lift up your hands. When you lift up your hands, you are saying, God, I surrender my life to you. It is not a girlish thing to do. It's not a weak thing to do. It's a courageous thing to do. Because when you lift up your hands, you are exercising your faith. And faith always pleases God. I want to lift up your hands and say, God, take my life, take my dreams, and use them for your glory. Thank you, God, that you are the God of resurrection. 
and you are the God of life. Everything that we desire, everything that we imagine, only you shall be the one that will provide for us. We, though we may, when we say no to the world, it looks like we can be threatened. But Lord, we shall not be fearful. We shall continue to be who we are. We will continue to use what we have so that whatever we do to serve you and to serve your dreams, the Lord shall be with us. And we shall find favor. In fact, I will not say, we find favor in you. And we shall, we will, we are prosperous and successful with things that are seen, with things that are not uns that are unseen. We lift up everything unto your hands. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. And all God's people say, Amen. My sisters in Christ, yes, give the Lord a clap offering. Yes, I am looking forward in the last quarter that the hope that you have in God shall only increase, not only with things unseen, but God shall pour forth many, many more good things into our life, into our church, and all that we do, we prosper. Let us come and join together with Brother Ken to this last song to celebrate and receive. Yes, amen. Praise the Lord for it.